I'm Lindsay. And I'm Sarah. And together we're the co-founders of Whale Tales, a living library of cetacean stories. And today we're going to beguile each other with some fun dolphin facts. Plus a dolphin-y whale tale. So sit back and enjoy as we dive right in. and happy Dolphin Awareness Month. It is March. Spring is springing in the Northern Hemisphere and dolphins are dancing and diving and doing other de-alliterative word things. (laughs) And we're aware of it. Yes. Yes. (laughs) We are so aware. So aware, in fact, that we are recreating something that got a lot of positive feedback um, from you and from ourselves. Because, you know, sometimes we give each other feedback um, that we did last year for Dolphin Awareness Month, which is we have all shown up to record today with a new to us dolphin fact that we learned, but we have not shared with each other. And we're going to share them right now but i'm going first hooray Hooray! (laughs) so my fun dolphin fact which is new as of a paper that was published in late 2022 but it also only kind of got non-journal attention in december of 2023 so relatively new we shall say is that Bottlenose dolphins have an extra sense. Da, da, da. Specifically, it is a sense that sharks have, and lots of other marine creatures and land creatures and so on and so forth. Doesn't matter. The point is, drum roll please. They can see Bruce Willis. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Bruce We Willis haven't has tested that dolphin. theory yet, Lindsay. <laughs> Now I have to drum roll again, <laughs> Lindsay. Couldn't okay. hold myself. <laughs> it's true. This is very fair. Dolphins can sense electric fields. Mm. Ooh, so yeah. cool. So specifically, this study has been done on two bottlenose dolphins in the Nuremberg Zoo. Their names are Donna and Dolly. Great. No notes. <laughs> And the study started with, we will post in the show notes, the whole paper Hooray! because free science, ooh la la. Um, so you can read the whole paper and I encourage you to, not only because it's a fascinating paper, but because it's very diagram heavy in terms of explaining how they conducted the study with Donna and Dolly to try and detect and basically train them to recognize electric fields and then tried to measure the variety and kind of like the strength of the electric field that they could recognize. So there's a lot of diagrams of, you know, like the apparatus they used in the studies and all that kind of stuff is really, really cool. But basically the hypothesis originated when the researchers who were Tim Hunter and Guido Denhart were watching a bottlenose dolphin calf, which I think we've talked about on the pod before. Um, many cetaceans, when they are first born, they have little hair, mm-hmm. um, very similar to whiskers on their beaks or rostrums. Um, and they were looking at these, they've called them whiskers in the paper. They were looking at these whiskers on the dolphin calves. And when those fall out, when the, when the vibrissae fall out, it leaves behind these pits And they notice that the pits closely resemble the pits in a shark's Mm -hmm. nose area, a rostrum area, that are the ampullae of Lorenzini. I haven't said that in so So long. long. I'm so impressed that came back to me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's been almost a decade since I've said that. Um, Yes, the, the pits in a shark's rostrum are called the ampullae of Lorenzini, and that's how they detect electric fields. And sharks have been known to do this for quite some time, and they're very, very good at it. Um, and so these two researchers were like, huh, I wonder. And turns out, yeah, dolphins can detect electric fields. They're not as good at it as sharks. So, you know, score for one for shark, but that's fine, because sharks deserve love too. Um, but they are very sensitive. And what's particularly interesting is, so I'm not going to give a whole electric field lecture because A, I don't understand it enough to do that. And B, that's not the podcast you signed up for, listeners. (laughs) 
But what I will say is there are there are two different kinds of electric fields. There are active electric fields and steady electric fields. And what's happening to the electricity in that electric electric field is as it would suggest. In an active electric field, it's alternating, it's moving, it's an active current that is kind of like fluctuating in its pulse. And in a steady electric field, that's not changing. So real life scenarios, an active electric field is something produced by a living creature. So all living things, especially all living animal things, produce electricity. Um, your heart beating is bioelectric. And the fact that it beats means that there are fluctuations in the amount of electricity going on. This is turning into an electric field lecture. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, an example of a steady electric field would be like the different electric magnetic fields going on in Earth. So what was really interesting is that the dolphins were better at sensing steady electric fields than they were at sensing active or alternating fields. They can sense both, but they were better at sensing steady fields. So the implications that these two researchers have put forth is obviously any amount of ability to sense bioelectricity would help you find animals that are hiding. So especially when bottlenose dolphins use their very pointed rostrums to kind of like dig in the sand, they might not solely be using echolocation, which can find prey under the sand, but they might also be relying on the ability to sense electro hmm. something. Huh. I lost my train of thought for a second, but like to sense the electric, yeah, to sense the electricity of their prey as well as their echolocation. Um, but also because they are better at sensing the steady electric fields, they might be using this to orient themselves to Earth. Huh. Hmm. Hmm. So there you go. Interesting. In summary, two bottlenose dolphins named Dolly and Donna are able to sense electric fields, and it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yay! So fun. Who wants to go next? Uh, I'll go. Okay. Um, so mine is older. An older fact, not new like yours. Mm. Um... <laughs> But it's an important one. It's my, I just kind of had a weird, like a query in my head. And then looking into this is one of those ones where you think about all of that kind of stuff that people might know already and like how important it is and how necessary it is to do all the baseline research on all animals. Um, again, we talk about this all the time coming from a place where we live next to the most well-known cetaceans in the history of the world it's well, among hard them. to it's hard to uh realize at times that other animals don't have that kind of some of them do don't but some of them we can know absolutely nothing about anyway that's just a long rambly tale to talk about spotted dolphins because i was wondering if you could identify them with your dots with their dots their <clears> spots <throat> the answer seems to be probably not but they are um, individual. They are unique to the individual. However, probably not maybe when they're older because they do change. Ooh. So this study is from uh, a paper from 1997 from the Wild Dolphin Project, which has all of its papers online. Hooray! Um, and has been studying Atlantic spotted dolphins in the Bahamas for many, many years. Um, so basically what they've done, they did is they went down there, they, this paper is, um, also they wanted to look at sexual reproduction and a couple of different other things as well as sexual identification. Basically a lot of the baseline stuff of how do you identify things in dolphins, um, and reproductive stat status and all that kind of stuff. But so what they did was they sat in the beach for six, nine years, 1985 to 1994, and looked at dolphins, um, which sounds pretty dope to me. Um, but basically, because they knew these dolphins so well, and they knew a lot of their ages already, they were able to backtrack from that and identify the four different phases of spotted dolphins spotting over the course of their age. So actually, it's technically five, because they are born without spots, and there are some 
species or sub subspecies of spotted dolphins that don't actually have dots, but not these ones. So Atlantic spotted dolphins are born without dots. They're just gray, just boring gray dolphins. And then from for their first three to four years, they are two tone, which is just a one spot or something along those lines, kind of boring. And then um, from four to nine, they are speckled which is they develop at least two very exciting probably, um, black spots on their ventral side and then a few white gray ones on their dorsal. Um, and they start usually around three to four and it increases throughout those time phases. And then into the teen years, 10 to 16, they become mottled. Um, and that's when they develop extensive and merging gray and white spots on the dorsal surface and continue to gain spots on their black, on their backs, on their backs. Um, after that, as they age, the spots, they, be, they enter the fused state, which is the last state, and that's basically when um, the development of spots accelerates. Fused state is when they dark and white spots become excess, extensive and coalesce on the ventral and dorsal sides. Some old males have pronounced white rostrum tips, similar to reported in other species of spotted dolphin, um, and this color phase spans uh, up to 10 years. So that's the kind of thing that's interesting. So they do have to identify the way that they identify them is actually similar to Riso's with like, um, fins and nicks and stuff like that because their spots change. So probably when they grow, when they reach the age of maturity and their spots maybe slow down, they could be identified by them, but they, it's not a positive identifying feature, even though it is the identifying feature of the species. Um, so yeah, it was a cool, it's a cool study and it's a good, it's one of those ones that because it's a population of dolphins that come to the same place every year, the researchers are able to access it every year. It's one of those super long-term studies where you can know the individuals that you're studying, watch them grow, know their exact age, know their sex. And so then therefore you can learn so many things from them. And so this one, among with all the other ones, they've been studying these dolphins since the 80s they've been able to learn so many different things about the species of dolphin from these guys and yeah studying dolphins in the bahamas was literally what i thought i was going to do when i grew <laughs> up but now i'm here and it instead <laughs> amazing that's so cool Lince. um so it's very funny because my study is also about or my fact is also about bottlenose dolphins and also in the bahamas <laughs> hmm but unrelated to either of those things. So I found a very interesting paper because I was like, oh, last time we talked about foraging. I wonder if there's like more foraging stuff. So I was like, foraging, dolphins, something. I can't remember what I Googled. And this was like the third thing that came up based on my Google search. And so it's a paper called Behavioral Laterality in Foraging Bottlenose Dolphins. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I mean, I'm not that interested in bottlenose dolphins. Like, they're fine. But it wasn't what I was aiming for. But basically in the top level thing was turns out so lateralized behavior is what we call handedness so like being right-handed or left-handed and i'm sure we've talked about this before it, in particular like gray whales are known to mm -hmm. turn to the right turns out lots of animals exhibit handedness and this population Ooh. of bottlenose dolph dolphins uh, triceps truncatus in um, these shallow sandy waters off the bahamas um, in somewhere called bimini um, do a foraging behavior called crater feeding where they swim along the ocean floor where they're scanning using echolocation and then they'll do a sudden turn and bury their rostrum into the substrate to get the food and there's basically so based on data that they collected from 2012 to 2018 i should say this is a paper in the royal society open science journal and it's by uh, daisy kaplan and some other authors and so, yeah, so based on data that they collected from 2012 to 2018, they reported a significant right side. So doing a left turn in these dolphins. So they turn left and then their right side goes down towards the surface of the water or to, no, down towards the sand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And by significant, 709 turns were recorded. 99.4 of them oh were gosh. with their right side down. <laughs> Only... Only four were the other way, and they were all in one individual. Oh, Sinestra. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so they then go on to hypothesize about why this right side bias 
and it might actually have to do with echolocation production because Ooh. they referenced another study. I mean, they referenced all kinds of studies about other lateralization in other species, but in particular, another study where they looked at the phonic lips that are used to produce echolocation, because I think we also have talked about this before. The phonic lips, they have two pairs, and this study proved, or like pretty conclusively proved, um, that the when they echolocate, they, so they do the clicks with the right side phonic lips and the whistles and other vocals with mm. the left side. Um, so this is a paper from 2013. Before that, everybody had assumed that in order to do the complexity of clicks, they would need to be using both. But uh, this study basically was like, yeah, no, they only need one side. So all their wow. echolocation is done with their right side phonic lips. And uh, Terciops have a strong right eye preference as well. They're like, if they, if in studies where they've covered one eye or the other, they do, they have better, better visual um, acuity with their right eye. So all of these things, so like as they're echolocating, they like turn down to like put their um, right eye down towards where they're echolocating um, to be able to find the food, which I thought was fascinating. Wow. And also there's some really great pictures in the initial study of the overhead views of these and like sort of how they, how the turn works. Because I was, I was confused about like they turn left and then their right side's down. But it, once you see pictures, it makes sense. Yeah, so also this paper just has some really fascinating examples of lateralization across all kinds of species. There's mm. a lot of right-sided lateralization, but some on both sides. So, and I just found it was interesting that both eye and echolocation are both on the right side. So that means they're using the left side of their brain for all of their visualizing of information, whether that's like visual or yeah, sound or based information mm -hmm. and then they use it to somehow visualize i mean visualize is the wrong word it's a very anthropomorphic term for it but build a mental mm. model of an object's shape is all yeah. in the left hemisphere of their brain hmm. so yeah this i was completely fascinated and blown away that they were bo both that they were able to figure it out in the concept of the phonic lips thing like that study yeah. I don't really understand how they did it, but it's very fascinating to read about. And then, um, yeah, this other study that's able to sort of elaborate on that and hypothesize various reasons why this, like, right side down towards the where the food is um, bias. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I forgot to say that I couldn't find any good photos of the color the different phases of spotting there are photos in the paper but it is a scan of a paper of which is has photos in it that are scanned <laughs> <It's the laughs> and they're in black and white also so i'll tr keep looking for social media but if you are interested you could check out the paper but yeah they're not great anyway yours are probably better because it's well, it's newer and yeah. yeah and also they're not trying to show spots they're just like yeah. dolphin look at this dolphin underwater <laughs> yeah. yeah look at it turn mm -hmm. How did none of us make a Zoolander joke? I don't know. I was so distracted. I don't know. But that one poor dolphin was, gets bullied at school because he's Probably. left. Well, those were some dolphiny dolphin facts, Yay. people. Thank you for sharing. Hooray. I learned so much. Um, before we continue with the rest of the episode, we want to take a moment to tell you about how you can support our podcast and everything we do at Whale Tales. You can join us by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash whale tales. For a dollar a month, you can join at the porpoise level, $5 a month, the dolphin level, or $10 a month at the whale level. And each level comes with a variety of perks, including polls, thank you postcards, access to extended interviews or extra stories with guests. We just put up an extra story. It's awesome. Um, you can produce your own fun flipper fact segment of the pod. And we have two Patreon exclusive extra podcasts because we just can't get enough about talking about cetaceans um on alternating months we have our journal club episodes so our most recent one is coming out this month or did just come out it did come out yep thank you timing doesn't work in my brain um and we talk about dolphin sex because you know we don't talk about that enough <laughs> So if that's up your alley, join us for Journal Club as a dolphin or whale level patron. And then on alternating months, we have for our whale level patrons our super fun podcast, Whale Tales Watches, where we watch a thing or read a thing that is marine biologically adjacent 
I just keep making up words to describe <laughs> this podcast. Uh, and then we talk about what they got right and what they got wrong, and it devolves, oh, and it's yeah. always a great time. <laughs> always delightful. Um, our last episode of that for our patrons was an amazing movie. I can't stop talking about how much I love this movie. It's Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home, a.k.a. the one with the whales. Yeah, yeah. And next month, we will be watching Atlantis, the Disney movie, which none of us have watched for a very long time. So join us to hear about, you know, Disney's accuracy level as it continues. <laughs> we already know. Yeah. It's great. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to all of our patrons. You are so amazing. Agreed. Uh, great. And but don't worry if you aren't able to support us financially, but want to help out. There's still lots of things you can do. You can always leave us a rating or a review on your podcast platform of choice, which will help other people find us. And you can also just tell your cetacean science podcast loving friends about the podcast and everything we do at Whale Tales so that they can join in too. Yay! Plus, you can follow us on social media at whaletales underscore org, where you can send us your feedback so that we can keep making the podcast even better. We love hearing from you. Oh, so great. Please, please. Just say hi. Yeah. And hi, I love whales. <laughs> It'll make our day. It really will. All right. Does everybody know what time it is? Oh, Yay! I do. Yeah, you do? Mm -hmm. So excited. What time is it? It's fun flipper fact time. What time is it? It's fun flipper fact time. Dolphin edition. Yeah. Amazing. Today's fun flipper fact actually comes to us from the aforementioned Patreon hey. peoples. Patreon patrons? Sure. Patreon from our lovely patrons over at Patreon. How many times can I say that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to try. Yeah. <laughs> and this was a Patreon fun flipper fact poll where we polled our patrons. Oh my gosh, the amount of keywords <laughs> coming out of my mouth. And we asked them, "Which dolphin would you like to learn a fun flipper fact about in this month's episode?" And the results are in and the dolphin that our patrons most wanted to learn about was the humpback dolphin. Hooray! Da, 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 da. But which one? Oh. You might ask. Ah, ha, ha. So, we're getting back on another one of our very well-trodden <laughs> soapboxes. Oh, more taxonomy talk. <laughs> yup. Because there are not one, not two, not three, but Four recognized oh, no. species of humpback dolphins. Yep. Goodness gracious. That's right. Four recognized species of humpback dolphins. I thought that there's more of those than there are of orca species. Anyway. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, there is the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin, which lives in the, the Indo-Pacific. <laughs> Um, the Indian Ocean humpback oh. dolphin, which lives in the Indian, Indian Ocean. Ocean. The Atlantic humpback dolphin. So they really strain themselves on these ones, huh? Which lives in uh, the Atlantic. I'll get into the specifics of where, because it is not like the whole Atlantic. And finally, the Australian humpback dolphin, <laughs> which lives in Australia. You really thought I was going to say <laughs> Yeah. No, they don't go to New Zealand at all. It's very Australia. But isn't the so, Indo-Pacific around Australia, she asks? Yes, yes. Good point. Good point. So I will differentiate. The Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin... So, okay, actually, very specifically for all of these four different species, um, I'll stop being sarcastic. <laughs> they live in very very coastal waters so these okay. are not deep diving animals at all they if you look at a map of their distribution it's like you're back in whatever grade where you had to trace countries oh, yeah, yeah yeah so they're very 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 close to shore so because you asked the question lens with absolutely no sarcasm in your voice <laughs> either <laughs> the indo-pacific humpback dolphin is in the coastal waters of specifically Bangladesh, Brunei, and Cambodia. Okay. As well as parts of India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, or Burma, um, the People's Republic of China, the Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. All over the dang place. Yeah. Yes. 
Whereas the Australia, so you notice I did not say Australia, no. even though yes, the Indo-Pacific Ocean touches Australia. Um, but the Australian humpback dolphin is only found in the coastal waters of Australia and Papua New Guinea. Mm-hmm. Got it. So I mean, I get why they named the Indo-Pacific dolphin the Indo-Pacific. Like, yes, they they're kind of all over the place. <laughs> um, and then I guess saying the Australian and Papua New Guinea humpback dolphin was just a step too far. <laughs> Then the Indian Ocean humpback dolphin is in Bangladesh, as well as the Indo-Pacific dolphin. So they do have a little bit of overlap there. Um, Comoros, Egypt, also parts of India. So again, some overlap with the Indo-Pacific. Um, Iran, Iraq, Israel, Kenya, Kuwait... Madagascar, Mozambique, Myanmar, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Tanzania, and Yemen, as well as a couple of other places. Um, But not too much overlap. And again, in just very, very small coastal parts of these countries. And finally, the Atlanta humpback dolphin can be found in Angola, Benin, 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 I think Benin. Wow, why are there so many different ways to say that word? Um, the Congo, uh, both the Republic of Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo, because mm-hmm. those are two different things. Um, Equatorial Guinea, the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Togo, and the Western Sahara. Right. Mm. So, like around I the did practice the, the hook, like the curvy part of Africa, the north. Correct. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So, all of this is to say, I'm getting back on my soapbox, everybody. <laughs> Shocking. You've got four distinct, like, ge- not, not, and yes, geographically distinct, but like overlapping. In the same chunk of the map. And overlapping distributions of a dolphin that looks very similar. That was going to be my next question. (laughs) Nope. They look basically the same, except sometimes they're pink. I'll come back to that. That's the most interesting thing about them. And yet, at their global population, when you add all four species together, is smaller than the global population of orcas. But we can't get our act together <laughs> and decide that any of the ecotypes, not even just all of them, but any of them classify as a distinct different species. <sighs> One of these days, I'm man. never not going to be frustrated about that. <laughs> anyway, all this to say is this doesn't mean I don't like humpback dolphins. They're great. They didn't do anything wrong. They yeah. didn't. They don't All care what species they are. All of my animosity <laughs> and sarcasm comes to the naming people who, I mean, listeners know this, we're always mad at the naming people. <laughs> but not like the individuals, the system. Yeah, the system. <laughs> um, but humpback dolphins are great. They are typically pretty shy, less active than some of the deeper diving, more pelagic dolphin species that you can find in the area um so they're not usually a species that you will see a lot of but if you're close to shore they are also close to close to shore and they get their name from the distinct let's call it a hump because that's what they're all calling it the humpback dolphin so this distinct hump on their back and then the dorsal fin because they do have a dorsal fin as well comes out of Mm -hmm. their hump Mm. so it's kind of like there's a nice smooth back and then a yeah. If you're tracing, if you're tracing it looks like it. yeah. If you sort of like cover up the dolphin part and just had the the dorsal fin, it would be like how a like seven year old would draw a mountain. Mm, yeah, mm-hmm. not a little kid mountain, like a medium kid mountain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And as mentioned, sometimes they're pink. Yeah, so most of the time they're gray, but sometimes they're pink, and that's very cool. Yeah, that is very cool. Yeah. It is very cool. It's very pretty to see in pictures. 
so what causes the pink coloration because it's not based on age or what they eat or any of that it's it's just a genetic you know like some people have red hair and some people have black hair so adult humpback dolphins can be gray which is the the more predominant genetic trait they are they are often gray and then sometimes they can be white and sometimes they can be pink and it is not their skin pigment that is pink the pink color originates from their blood vessels so beneath the skin obviously uh, which overdevelop for thermoregulation so it just allows the blood to show through their skin and then they look pink and it's very very pretty they're very pretty dolphins and they come in all kinds of like varieties of mottled as well so there's like some gray dabbling ooh, ooh, la, la. or dappling mm. if we're going with horse related <laughs> terminology out now, of nowhere nicole say i was in <laughs> india which yes. and i see a humpback dolphin how do i know yes. which one it is i can't help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> which comes down to again my significant issues with the people who are the system who are naming these things um my best bet is that it would depend on what part of india Mm -hmm, you're in and if i knew a lot more More about about them then perhaps their distribution doesn't actually overlap because like distinct parts of india because obviously india is a big country india is very big (laughs) and has multiple coastlines so maybe that but i don't know that 100% 100% so fair. I'm not going to give up 100% accurate answer very fair well yes. thanks Excellent. patrons for voting in a fun way <laughs> hooray yes. we learned so much today yeah. yay and we got to rant hooray. all of my favorite things okay so now we have a whale tale and a call to action from Lauren Lauren would you like to introduce yourself before we go further Yes. So, hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm a scientific illustrator. I focus on uh, cetaceans, so whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Um, I've worked with species such as common bottlenose dolphins and Amazon River dolphins, and I am now working as a uh, environmental educator. So, very excited to be here today. Yeah, that's so cool. Awesome. Uh, do you want to start with a dolphin story? Yeah. Um. So definitely, I I will always think back of um, studying abroad in Brazil. It's one of my favorite um, experiences I've ever had. Um, And definitely with Amazon river dolphins. Um, I started to notice during the trip that um, I wasn't seeing them very often. It was pretty difficult to spot them when the boat was moving. And we were living on a river boat for about a week. And I started to realize that I would stay behind sometimes. So like other, the other people in our group would leave. And I asked my professor if I could just stay behind because I wanted to see if maybe I could spot them just from the boat while it was parked and quiet. Um, And I had some of the most amazing encounters um, observing them. Mm. It, It was, it was crazy once the, the boat would just stop and it would be quiet. It's like they would magically appear and they would start socializing around the boat. Um, My professor told me, like, you probably won't see them leaping. Um, I've never seen them leap. And lo and behold, when Mm -hmm. I was on the boat, um, started seeing them leap multiple times. Only got it once on my camera. I wish I could have. It was was hard to time uh, those leaps Mm, because they were very sudden. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that was definitely one of my favorite encounters, and it just kind of taught me to be patient um, and understand our our impact on those animals Mm -hmm. because those boats can be very loud. And once it was stopped and parked, they just were having a great time. They were feeding by our boat and socializing. So it was very special getting to witness that um, and just seeing um, how being quiet and patient, like the rewards um, of respecting wildlife so yeah oh that's amazing that's just so far (laughs) up the bucket list i can't even deal with it incredible great they're amazing um so what kind of research were you guys working on with the river dolphins so i asked my professor to do an independent study so uh there used to be a professor at the university that i went to who actually did research on amazon river dolphins Mm. he's a psychology professor Mm -hmm. um Sadly, 
we, we also used to have a uh, American Cetacean Society student chapter at that university. So he used to be very involved, but once he, uh, had, once he left the university, it's been very quiet with the dolphins. Um, and I just wanted to, I wanted to work, focus on a project that was more about outreach um, and merging scientific illustration. So I definitely asked her, I was like, can I just, you know, I have my camera. I would love to take some really good photos and make kind of a field guide, something that she could use for future students um, who are going on this trip and maybe even encourage more uh, independent studies and research on these animals. Uh, so one of my, the project that I did was, of course, outreach. Um, I made a, a big poster, um, talked about all the different behaviors. Um, just, I focused mostly on what we saw on the trip. They can, of course, show a lot of other different behaviors, but I focused specifically on um, what I saw, um, included some other things, um, some of the threats to the species, uh, but it was just a big poster and I'm hoping that um, she will use it in the future for students. I'm sure she has. I will be presenting it um, in April again cool. to the university. So it's definitely been help helping people um, learn more about those animals. I'm, as, as an environmental educator, I'm very passionate mm -hmm. about sharing those animals. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's really cool. Um, so speaking of which, we also wanted to get a call to action from you. You um, posted a little while ago on Twitter about some of the work you're doing with the Stranding Network and some things mm -hmm. that people can do and kind of help out all cetaceans. But, you know, we're very dolphin themed this month, of course. So, <laughs> yeah. what? Yes. <laughs> tell us a little bit more about the work you've been doing for them. Awesome. So um, I recently uh, became a volunteer for them. Uh, this was uh, in 2023. Um, they actually hadn't opened up volunteer opportunities since COVID, mm. so 2020. Um, so once I saw that, like three years later, I had, I put in the application like three years ago, um, and they were finally opening them back up. Uh, so we do a lot there. Um, this, this can include uh, necropsies. It can be necropsies in the lab, um, on the beach. Um, there, we also respond to live strandings. Of course, that takes a lot more training mm -hmm. and time uh, volunteering for them. Um, we also haven't, I think we only had, we had a mom and calf that were mm -hmm. in a place they weren't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the more uh, <laughs> experienced volunteers helped with that one. Uh, so we do necropsies, do uh, rescues, of course we do outreach. Um, and then we also do rehab. Uh, we haven't had a rehab patient um, in a while. Uh, one that probably a lot of people know of is Izzy. Izzy now lives at the Clearwater uh, Marine Aquarium. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a dolphin that people were um, interacting with in the wild. Um, and then she eventually had to be uh, rehabbed. And now she's taken care of in Florida. <laughs> Great. Uh, so volunteering for them has been awesome. I know that the first um, experience, <clears throat> excuse me, first experience I had with them was a necropsy. Ooh. I'm very nervous for it because mm -hmm. necropsies can be smelly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember I got the email that night. And, of course, they can never tell when a dolphin is going to strand. They, you know, it, it all happens on random. So you'll get a random email saying, oh, we need volunteers to help us now or tomorrow. So I got an email that was talking about the, the uh, eight-foot male bottlenose dolphin that was found in one of our ship channels. Yeah, he was big. <laughs> he was actually found by one of the other uh, research institutes that I uh, worked with as an undergrad. Um, so they, they pulled him in from the ship channel and they wanted to do necropsy on him and they were looking for volunteers. So that night I ran to CVS and I grabbed some Vicks because Vicks helps with the smell. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very nervous about it because I've heard about people passing out during necropsies because um, it's just you're in there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I got to help out with that and it was so cool. And I, the smell didn't bother me that much, which is awesome. Were you uh, but inside also, or outside? So we were inside. Okay. That definitely yeah. helps. I, the only necropsy <laughs> yes. I've been to was outside in the summer and that was, was yeah, that was a lot. Anyway, continue. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
but it was like especially as a scientific illustrator Mm -hmm. um i've never seen a dolphin that close up yeah Um, i normally see them from shore um or i've been on a boat-based survey and i saw them we can get closer on the boat-based surveys because we have a permit um but seeing one that close and seeing all the markings and of course it, it i was working on a project before that necropsy where I needed to do a full body illustration of one of the common bottlenose dolphins. And I had already finished that project. And I was like, Oh, of course I see like, you know, super up close, Mm -hmm. like perfect (laughs) view of a dolphin after I'd already submitted that, that project. Uh, But it was incredible um, seeing the different organs too. Um, Mm. We didn't, I believe that we didn't find a cause um, of death on that one. I think it was just old age. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was very big. He was very cool. I, I can't relate enough how oh, cool yeah. it was. I've been hoping they haven't done another, from one, my knowledge, they haven't done any more in the lab um, in a while. They're mm-hmm. mostly doing them outside because uh, January through March is our stranding season. Okay. So they've just been coming in. And mm-hmm. now that I'm, I'm employed full time, it's hard to get yeah. back out there because it'll just happen on a Monday morning. Mm-hmm. It's like yep. I'm at work. Uh, yeah. but, uh, hope for the weekends or days that I have off so great so aside from volunteering which can obviously there's wait lists and stuff at times and training um and mm-hmm. depending on where people are what can other people do do you think that can help all of dolphins or cetaceans in their everyday life awesome so um I definitely think that if you live in an area um where you can see them from shore um, or maybe you have a reputable whale watching company, definitely go with reputable companies. Um, also try to view them from shore if you can. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great way to minimize your impact. Um, you can watch them as long as you can um, if they're close to shore. Uh, I know that where where we are, um, we don't have any... Um, I know that most of these uh, programs are voluntary, mm-hmm. um, but we don't have any dolphin tours that have any of these like you know oh we've been a, we have this certification to do this mm-hmm. um so that's why I, I prefer to watch from shore because i know that i don't i'm not having much of an impact um also if you're ever out there if you see any monofilament pick it up if there's a monofilament um dispose uh like a little trash disposal for monofilaments monofilament specifically um great to use those um, and then maybe even talk, talk to people around you. And, and um, I know I've had a lot of really cool uh, conversations with fishers. I'm mm-hmm. um, asking them about, you know, how, you know, how often do you see dolphins out here? Um, what are your interactions with dolphins normally? And sometimes they'll tell me they think they're cool. Sometimes they tell me that they don't like them. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so uh, definitely cleaning up monofilament, watching them responsibly. Um, keeping the area as it was when you visited. So if you go to the beach, of course, pick up all of your stuff. Um, And of course, volunteer, volunteer Mm -hmm. if you can. There's so many cool opportunities. We only see one species uh, here in Texas off the coast. Um, But I know there's other places you can see all, all different kinds of species and getting involved. You'll have so many cool opportunities and even just reaching out with a simple email to to someone being like, Hey, how, how can I get involved? Like networking and uh, just making connections is so important. Uh, especially if you really want to get involved to the point of like getting into research um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or rehabilitation for cetaceans, uh, all of that. So, yeah, no, yeah. that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, <laughs> would you mind sharing uh, with us your social media handles or website or anything you want to send people to get to know you or the places that you work with yeah so um you can mostly find me on instagram that's where i post all, almost all the time <laughs> so my, my instagram handle is lauren um, l-a-u-r-y-n f underscore illustration uh, that's where i post my scientific illustrations my wildlife photography uh, the dolphin photos that I take from shore. Um, and then of course I'm on Twitter. Uh, it, I believe it is the same handle. It's Lauren F underscore illustration. Um, so those are the best ways to find me and kind of find out what I'm, uh, 
up to. You can also check out the uh, Texas Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Um, you can just type them in on Google. They've been doing a lot of really cool posts for Dolphin Awareness Month. Um, there's been a lot of, especially as volunteers, we've had a lot of really cool opportunities to uh, get involved this month with outreach, especially talking to people about dolphins, getting out there. Um, and then you can also check out the uh, Galveston Bay Dolphin Research Program. Uh, I was a research student intern with them. They are awesome. Um, I know the researchers. Uh, we meet up sometimes. Um, it's really cool to be working with them. Um, with some of my projects. Uh, so it's a great way to especially learn about some of the dolphins that we have uh, here in Texas, yeah. especially in Galveston. So cool. That's super cool. Thank you so much, Lauren, for coming and of course. talking to us about dolphins. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that story. That was lovely. Woo. Well, I think that brings us to the end, folks. We did it. Good job, and team. we'd love to hear your thoughts on the thing that we just did. Or any of the episodes that we've ever recorded, ever, ever, ever. So please visit our website, whale-tales.org, and find links to our social media handles so that you can drop us a line. You can also head to our website to subscribe to the podcast, learn about supporting us and becoming a patron, and read over 1,300 whale, dolphin, and porpoise stories. Wow. I know. That's whale-tales.org. Tales like the stories, not tales like the animal. And if you've seen the citation, we would love to add your story to our library. You can click the share link on our website, or you can contact us on social media at whaletales underscore org, or you can email us a voice memo and tell us all about your incredible citation encounter. Finally, we want to acknowledge that we recorded today's episode on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples and the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, as well as the homelands of the Tawasan First Nation. Thank you, everybody, and we hope you have a dolphin-y whaley great day.